Most of what archaeologists know about the Saxons has been discovered by excavating their cemeteries. Last summer, we dug one here in Braymore in Hampshire because we wanted to find out more about this. It's a brass Byzantine bucket which was found in a grave here. Over our three-day live dig, we not only learned an awful lot about how people lived here, but also how people died here nearly 1,500 years ago. During the frantic course of our three live programmes, we delved into archaeology as diverse as prehistoric flint napping and Bronze Age waterside rituals. But while all this was going on, our documentary crew were following the archaeology in detail to bring you the in-depth story of Saxon burial rites and extraordinary grave goods. This mysterious 6th century tinned brass Byzantine bucket, only the third ever found in Britain and one of only 11 in the world, is almost 2,000 miles away from where it was made in Antioch, now in modern-day Syria. So why was it buried in this idyllic part of Hampshire? Could it be a prized possession of a long-forgotten Saxon chieftain buried on a mound in this field? This has got to be the flattest, most unprepossessing field we've ever dug on. What about this big mound in front of us? I see no mound. I see this vague no, rise here. There's a great big round mound in front of us. <laughs> well, on this big round mound, yeah. is this where we found the bucket? Yeah, they found the bucket. Uh, metal detectors found the bucket, but there's also been lots of other finds from here. And they're the sort of finds we'd expect to get with a cemetery. So, you know, that's what we think might be buried here. This looks to me more like what I'd think of as a Bronze Age barrow. Well, it's not uncommon for Anglo-Saxon burials to be popped into pre-existing Bronze Age barrows, so it could be that. When the bucket was found, did they excavate the barrow? No, they did a few... Well, when the bucket was found, the metal detectorist just dug out the bucket, of course. But then, when it was recognised how important the bucket was, the archaeologists came in and did about seven metre square test pits, just a few tiny pits. What we want to do is excavate a bit more and find out more about where the bucket came from, what was it in. A bit more. We've got three days. Does that mean that we can open up the whole barrow? Oh, no, no. I mean, I think we'll be, you know, we'll be sampling the burials if they're there, and we'll probably have a look at a section across the barrow just to make sure there is a barrow, but we won't be able to do any more than that. With the archaeology only a few centimetres below the surface, the mechanical diggers can only be used to carefully scrape away the topsoil, which is proving to be rock hard. Our plan is to open three trenches on the mound. The first is to examine the context around where the bucket was found. The second trench will investigate the test pits where spearheads and shield bosses have been discovered. The third will attempt to find out if there's any Bronze Age structure to the mound. As the trenches are opened, geophys begin a magnetometer survey on the rest of the field, looking for anything that may indicate the layout and scale of the Saxon cemetery. We've got a problem with burials because you dig the grave, you put the body in, then you put the same material back so there's no contrast. But we will see the iron objects. And so we're going to grid out the whole area and we can map those and then get the metal detector guys in. They can do the non-ferrous material and we can compare the two. And who, are, who knows what else we're going to get. Our team of metal detectorists have only got a few hours to conduct a scan of the entire site. Marking any non-ferrous hits with pegs, this information will be combined onto a 3D topographic map with John's mag survey showing any clustering of metal artefacts, indicating possible burials. In the past, night hawking, or the illicit metal detecting and removal of artefacts from this site, has been a major problem. But it was a responsible detectorist who originally found the Byzantine bucket. When did you find it? Um, a wet and windy morning in October 1999. 
Now, Typical I, detecting weather. Yeah, it's such a miserable <laughs> day. Uh, I know you'd, you'd already found something Saxon, hadn't you? That's right, yes. So, um, the second thing I found was the, um, the Byzantium bucket, or Citula, they call it. Oh, right. Um, I dug down about two feet. Um, initially, there was something green. It looked like a handle or possibly a Bronze Age talk or something like that. I rushed back to the car. I've got my trowels. Um, I started to excavate down the right-hand side of the, um, what was now, obviously, apparently, it was a bucket. Could you, all, could you see any of the embossing around the bucket? Or nothing like at all. That? Nothing right. at all. It was, it was covered in mud and it was pouring down, you know. Steve took the mud-encrusted object to Salisbury Museum, who called in local portable antiquities officer Sally Worrell. I'm basically working with finders, mostly metal detectors, to try and encourage them to record all their finds with us. I mean, there are thousands of objects found every year, and basically we're trying to build up as a bigger picture as possible. So, uh, actually, what Steve did was exactly the right thing. It was fantastic that he didn't clean it, and that was very important. Um, and so it was really only at the point where, when the object was x-rayed that we, we began to sort of realise its importance. And its rarity. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, what we're trying to do is encourage cooperation between finders and um, archaeologists and museums. And Steve reported the find immediately, and this has led to further work and our understanding of this apparently really important site. Phil's opening a trench to try and find out the extent of the Saxon cemetery. To give him the best chance of finding the edge, he has a plan to excavate a 30 metre long trench. Is that non ferrous? Yeah. Back on the mound, Steve Bolger is busy helping Carenza scan her trench. And there seems to be no shortage of metal detector hits blue for ferrous, possibly spearheads or knives, and green for non ferrous, maybe brooches or buckles. The size of that is quite good for a shield boss. Can I just go over and yeah. see? Yeah, I mean, that's my span's eight inches, so that's not bad for a, for a shield boss with some maybe studs and things yeah. around it. Um, and then, so you might be looking here at a, at a grave with something non ferrous there. Jenny's trench is at last starting to yield the first signs of archaeology, very degraded human bones. As well as finding out more about the people who were buried here, we've set Stuart the task of trying to find out where the Saxons lived. To a lot of people, that's just a mound in a field. To me, it's a mound in a landscape that's been evolving for thousands of years. I'm keen to find out why it was there and, more importantly, the people that are buried there, where did they live? And I'm using old maps, geological maps, air photographs, to try and understand that. And have you come up with anything so far? Well, already very interesting things are emerging. We've got some old maps which show a very, very peculiar but interesting settlement pattern. And I think that's going to tell us something about where the settlement was that's associated with this cemetery. Over in Katie's trench, there seems to be little sign of any Bronze Age structure to the mound. We have been thinking, Francis, yeah. that originally this mound might have been a Bronze Age barrow. What do you reckon? Well, at first glance, it looks like one, a, a very big one, but there are things that mm, aren't quite right. Like what? Well, I'm not happy about this being a Bronze Age barrow ditch, you know, the ditch that produce the stuff for the mound. It, it's, it's not right. I'd expect layers of gravel in it and slipping off the mound, and there aren't any. But we've got Bronze Age finds, haven't we? Yeah, there's lots of Bronze Age find. Um, these flints, I mean, they're all about sort of 2000, 2500 BC, but they're not the sort of things I'd expect to find in a barrow. I'd expect to find sort of juicy things like great big arrowheads and things in a barrow, but this looks like the sort of stuff you picked up off the kitchen floor. So, are you saying that you think that this mound might be a natural feature that people have used over thousands of years, yes. maybe, and the Saxons then decided to bury their people in it? Yes, that's the way it's looking. I won't swear to it, but that's how it looks right now, I think. Yeah. The human bones found earlier in Jenny's trench have now revealed themselves to be two individual skeletons, a rare example of a Saxon double burial. But you think, Andrew, that these two bodies went into one grave at the same time? Yeah, I do indeed. I mean, you very rarely find early Anglo-Saxon graves so close together as separate events. So um, looking at the aspect of, uh, of these, I mean, almost certainly you've mm. got two people put into a grave at right. the same time. And is that just opportunism? Is it... We two people happen to die on the same day, we'll dig one big hole rather than two, or is it that, you know, father and son, mother and daughter, 
It'd be a bit of a that coincidence would. that they died on the same day, wouldn't it? So are we yeah. talking, are we talking it, about it some sort be. of episode where... Yeah, the one thing we've got to bear in mind at this period is, is sort of pl- a plagues, effectively. Right. Um, and it's quite likely that you'll get close members of a family dying at, the, at, at a similar time. Karenza, this is the trench where the bucket was originally found, isn't it? That's right, and we now know exactly where it did come from. See that square in the middle of the trench there? Well, you just drew that, didn't you? Well, yes, but we've drawn it round a metre square test pit that was dug around the Anglo-Saxon bucket. Any other finds? Well, the other stuff we found is all much earlier, which is quite interesting. See, we've had masses of this flint. See all this lovely, really black, shiny stuff? It's Bronze Age flint. And the fascinating thing is that it seems to all have come from one or two original bits of flint, somebody has sat here making flint tools on this very spot in the Bronze Age. So even though the mound itself may not be Bronze Age, it looks like almost 4,000 years ago people were sitting here making flint tools. To try and find the extent of the cemetery, Phil seems to have gone a bit mad with the JCB. Phil, you have dug the biggest trench in the world here. <laughs> Not much in it, I'm afraid. No, no. This is the, the, the main terrace gravel where, where we've got the cemetery. The, the important thing is we've not actually got any burials ourselves, so oh, we must true. be outside so, yeah, the must, cemetery. Yeah, doesn't come this far. But have we've, you found anything at all? We've got a, a, a small ditch there. Mm-hmm which has got some pot in it. All right, but this is not, uh, this is not ancient. That's from Verwood, which is the local post-medieval factory around here. Right, is, yeah. and flint, of course, I had to have flint. <laughs> really <laughs> that. And a bit of animal bone. Yeah, well, so I think we should shut this trench down. No, 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 no. Huh? We haven't finished it yet. We must extend the trench through to the floodplain itself to get a transect right the way through. Right. And we must know how, this, how old this, this ditch is. OK. So, and do you think we might still find something? Oh, yeah. The position of Phil's trench on the edge of the floodplain is apparent when you see it superimposed on a topographic map of the site. Add to this the results of John's mag survey and the metal detector sweep, and we can see that all of the metal anomalies are concentrated in clusters on the mound. We're at the trench, which I think is the trench where all that ferrous information was coming up. That's right, we've surveyed the whole area and targeted this one. And how have we done, Carenza? Well, you know, I said earlier we had some metal finds possibly coming up that might help. Yeah. It's now turned up and it's fantastic. It's exactly what we wanted. It's the first Anglo-Saxon find for you here. And look at it. What is it? What is it? It's a spearhead. (laughs) See it from the point there? all the way down to the ferrule at the end where the wooden shaft would have gone into it. And the fascinating thing as well is it comes just about a foot from where that bucket turned up, so it looks as if it might be part of the same burial. Everyone's packed up and gone home now. <laughs> How's the day been for you? Well, I'm still worried about this trench. We had loads and loads of metal detector signals for copper alloy o- objects and they haven't been coming out. Actually, I'm wrong. Not everyone's gone home. There's Katie <laughs> still ploughing a lonely furrow. What have things been like for you? It's been really frustrating all day. I found very little, just a few iron nails and a few flint flakes. But in the last 10 minutes, I have just found this wonderful spearhead. Another spearhead? No later than 7th century. So what does this tell us? Well, it's even more of a conundrum because that's iron and all these signals are copper alloy or bronze. Day two of our excavation into our Saxon graveyard, and we've got one or two tricky questions to answer. These two skeletons appear to be buried in the same grave. So why would that be? Were they possibly related to each other? Were they just buried on the same day? What do you reckon, Margaret? Well, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to be sure. There are various possibilities, and one of the ones that we've seen on other Anglo-Saxon cemeteries is that graves appear to have been left open and then a second burial put in at some later stage. So what are we going to do with these chaps now? Well, uh, firstly, this isn't a chap. This one we don't know, but this is definitely a woman. How do you know that? Because a part of the pelvis survived, which is clearly female. And were there any grave goods associated with this when it was originally dug up? Yeah, this one had a shield and there was a spearhead lying here. Why would a shield and a spear be associated with a woman when she was buried? Well, why not? Maybe she was a warrior. They had warriors in, who were women in Saxon times? Well, we don't, we don't know, but we do know that at the end of the Iron Age there were warriors in Britain. There was Boudicca, there was Queen Cartumandua, and she was uh, a warrior queen. So if this tradition survived before the Romans, maybe at the end of Roman influence you get the re-emergence of powerful warrior women. Yesterday's metal finds are now in the conservation lab. The spearhead from Katie's trench is first cleaned of all surface soil, showing the concave profile of the blade, a sure sign of 6th century workmanship. 
An X-ray of the same blade shows us the internal structure of the shaft socket, definite proof that it's Saxon. Back in Trench 2, even more metalworks being uncovered. This time, a shield boss placed on top of a skull. Once X-rayed, traces of rivets around the edge become apparent. Now, Ian, I know that this is the shield boss. This is what they've been finding out there. What, what's it made of? It's made of iron, and of course, this is the only piece that survives, and with, of course, the rivets around there. The rest of the shield's made of wood covered with leather, and, of course, the other bit that survives is the iron hand grip that goes behind, held on with leather. This is, this is a big thing to oh, be buried huge. with, yes, isn't it? Absolutely and, massive. And, and, I mean, yeah. some of the weapons... Yes, and some of the weapons are big. Look at the spear. I mean, it's absolutely huge stands really tall. And of course, if you're a guy of high status, you'd be buried with a fabulous sword as well. So are these common things uh, to be finding in graves? Yes, they are fairly common. Spears particularly, and then uh, spears and shields are the next thing. And then finally, if you're really um, important, you have a spear, a shield and a sword. And what do they want them for? Why are they in the graves? It's how you arrive in the afterlife, maybe, or it's a question of just pure status. And as grave goods go, there could be no status higher than our Byzantine bucket. We've set craftsman Ray Walton the challenge of trying to make a replica bucket using a single sheet of brass and, where possible, authentic tools and techniques. The first stage is to mark out the bucket base on the brass disc, then begins the first of many hammering processes to try and raise the bucket sides. The skill in the hammering is to ensure that all of the blows are the same strength to prevent bumps and bulges. But all this hammering makes the metal brittle, so every few minutes the brass has to be gently heated, then quenched in water and pickled in vinegar. It's going to be a real race against time for Ray to finish. Before we can lift the double burial skeletons for further analysis, they have to be recorded to show their relative positions, best done in three dimensions using some new technology. How does it work, your gadget? Well, basically it's a, a double triangulation. Um, this emits a magnetic field in a, a sphere and these two points allow you to track the position of the wand within the magnetic field so it knows where it is. And similarly, these two cameras see the laser stripe when it comes out the middle. Right. And that gives you your other triangulation, and it's yeah. the combination of those things that give you all the points on the surface, just as you move the wand over it. Yeah. So it's similar to what you might do with surveying on the ground, yeah. but in smaller scale, Very with detailed. a lot more points. That's brilliant. You can even see its teeth and everything. It's going to be a few hours before all the data is processed to create the full 3D image. With the three trenches on the mound firmly placed inside the Saxon cemetery, it fills Trench 4, the epic lonely furrow at the bottom of the field that doesn't seem to be producing any archaeology. Phil, all day yesterday you were here trying to see whether this trench had any relationship with the cemetery, has it? Well, no, we, we, we've stripped out a large area of the gravel there and we've found no burials at all. We now know that the, the cemetery does not extend this far. We've also managed to pick up the edge of the floodplain. So we know that the area where the cemetery is has always been on a mound. It's always been on a, a spur of dry land. So and was there any point in digging this trench in the yes, first place? Yes, there was. The only way you can actually prove whether there's, a, a, in this case, the cemetery was there is to dig it. We've done it, there is no cemetery here. That shows us the extent of the cemetery. So are we going to close up this trench now? We're going to finish recording these ditches here, close the, the trench down and then get everybody else up the top. With the double burial in trench two now recorded, it's time for the delicate excavation of the bones. So once all these bones have been taken out, what's going to happen to them? Well, we're going to take them down to the bone lab and very, very gently try and clean off the soil and then have a good look at them to see if there's any pathology or healed trauma or anything like that so that we can see if there are any diseases or sort of fractures or anything that can tell us anything about lifestyle really. What's the quality of these bones like? Awful. Oh, really? <laughs> In a nutshell, awful. Why is that? It's the pH of the soil, which What's is that mean? the acidity. It's probably quite an acid soil. It's also this sort of um, alluvial sediments, sort of river valley floodplain sediments. They set like concrete in the summer, and then in the winter they're wet, so the bones continually drying and wetting, and, and that doesn't do any good either. But where did all these Saxons who are buried here live? 
The landscape surrounding our site shows a continuity of use from the Stone Age through the medieval and Elizabethan periods to the present day. But Stuart and Mick seem to have found clues to the Saxon settlement in the heart of the present day village. This looks to me, Stuart, like absolutely classic dispersed settlement, you know. You've got cottages all over the place, bits of green, lots of bits of woodland. And it's what you'd expect from a Saxon settlement pattern that's never got turned into a village. Funny you should say that. There's been a big field walking exercise over here. Yeah. And in this field over here, which is, which is beyond that big tree right. over yonder, right. there's been oodles of Saxon occupation debris, pottery, all that sort of stuff from in there, but from nowhere else. So that is strongly suggestive that that's the settlement and that's where the people mm. were likely to be buried. But what attracted the Saxons to this particular valley in the first place? I've had a look at the geological maps and the air photography and so on, and one thing is actually quite dramatic when you look at it. Oh, it's crikey. That's the river, the blue line, yeah. and this, this lighter blue area is the floodplain, the area oh. where historically the river would flood yeah. and the banks would overflow. So this is all wet down here. And what's quite significant about this site is a big gravel peninsula which sticks out into this valley floodplain. This sticks almost right across the valley, doesn't it's it? It's like a, a barrier, isn't it? Yeah. And our site sat right on it, so if you came from the south, you'd see it. If you came from the north, you'd see it. So any barrow or cemetery in that position would have been a highly visible yeah. and significant monument. So now we know why the Saxons settled here, but there's a huge amount of debate amongst historians as to who the Saxons really were. Warlike European invaders or indigenous Britons under new management? From the beginning of day one, we've been talking about Saxons and Anglo-Saxons. When according to the Venerable Bede, this entire area of Hampshire plus the Isle of Wight was occupied by a people called the Jutes, who originated from Jutland, now part of modern Denmark. And in fact, Sandy is in fact a Jute from Jutland. So how long are they here? Well, we think they arrived in the late 6th century and occupied the Isle of Wight and all this area, probably from the River Avon over virtually to Hailing Island. And that continued to be the case when our cemetery was in action right the way up to 686. And in that year, they swept down from the north, from the, the Thames Valley, uh, a tribe of, of Saxons under their King Cadwalla. And he conquered this area, committed genocide and even ethnic cleansing on the Isle of Wight. Do you buy all this? Them. Do you buy this? Well, Robin's getting all this from Bede. Bede was writing in the early 8th century and he's talking about the political realities of his own day. Now this could have been in the 8th century, it, this could have been a kingdom with memories of a Jutish king, but we're talking here about the ordinary people, the ordinary Anglo-Saxons, the ordinary whoever they called themselves. In answer to Helen, why the heck did they call the new forest the, the forest of the Jutes? Why was the Itchin the area of the Jutes? Well, I'll tell you I think why. I'll leave them to it. The Jutes are going to be fighting the Saxons for some time to come. Down at our cameo site, Ray's making good progress with his replica Byzantine bucket, even though at the moment it looks more like a fruit bowl. So is, is this the way we think it was made originally? Oh, I'm sure it probably was, yes. Yeah. I mean, you can see exactly the same um, techniques um, in modern times, you know, in, in China or in Turkey. Yeah. There are guys mm. doing just this. Mm. So, I mean, I'm sure this is exactly how they did it. It's going to take 40 or 50 complete rotations of very accurate hammering and 40 or 50 heatings and quenchings to get the sides upright. That's before the thousands of punch hole engravings and the tinning process. On the mound, trench one's beginning to look more like a maze. The various holes and levels inside the trench are an attempt to decipher the very complicated archaeology. Carenza, things got really good here last night, didn't they? Yeah, we had that beautiful Anglo-Saxon spearhead, and now we've had the other thing we really, really wanted, which is a grave cut, the actual edge of the grave that the body was placed into. It's turned up in the bottom of this test pit, which has gone down further than it had before, and you can see we've got the end of one long bone showing out of the section here, and then the edge of the grave cut is actually this contrast here between the darker fill and the lighter fill. In Trench 3, Katie's got traces of human foot bones at one end, but no sign of a skull at the other. 
She's having real trouble finding the outline of the grave cut in the tightly compacted earth. Katie, have you got any more of those skeletons yet? Oh. No, but I'm so excited. I'm just finding... What's this, then? ...some bone. We've, we've taken the trench back so yeah. that we can see the whole of the grave yeah. that these feet belong to. Yeah. And having done so, I've exposed this post hole. Oh. I've been going down inside it, and uh, I think I've found a knife or a Good spearhead. Lord, that's a big piece of metal across yeah. the middle there. Cool. And really excitingly, I've just found some more bone as well. Ah. Are all these bits of bone, then? Well, just this bit and this bit are bone. Yeah. And this is the metal object here. Oh, yes. Well, hopefully the skull yeah. is right underneath here. Yeah. OK, well, I'll pop back later. That's, that's very exciting. With Trench 4 at the bottom of the field closed down, Phil takes over Trench 5 on the mound, where there are a number of geophys and metal-detecting anomalies. A very well-preserved iron spearhead a metre below the surface was obviously responsible. Below that, two skeletons, another double burial. We got... One of the thigh bones there. Coming down to the scapula here. There should be, what is it over here? The other head of the femur. Yeah, the other femur. Oh, hang on. That does not look like a thigh bone to me. It looks exactly like a skull. That's right down over the other one's leg, isn't it? I know, I know. Yeah, look at it. Oh, that's a skull, yes. Oh, God, ah. Well, I suppose not much we can do about it now. I should have to clear off all this. Yeah. And let's get down onto it. Get the rest of the legs of that and just see whether it's an isolated bit or whether it's a complete body again. Yeah, I mean, it might just be a bit, it's might, not it? But, it? but it's a bit strange if it is a skull because it's sort of lying between the legs of the other two. After an hour of careful excavation, the layout of the burial becomes apparent. They're two superbly preserved skeletons. They're so different from anything else we've had. Absolutely wonderful. In terms wonderful. of condition. This is obviously a, a big, hulky, hulky male. You know, look at that skull, great big brow ridges, really rugged, robust face. And the pelvis is an absolute classic male pelvis. Very narrow, very high, android sort of shape. Yeah, no question at all about that one. This one's less clear. The skull... It still is quite sort of gracile. It's nowhere near as robust as this. If we just look at the pelvis, yeah, the pelvis is very much male. And that's the sort of thing you see very often, a slightly gracile face and a, and a male pelvis in people who die in their early 20s, males who die in their early 20s, still tend to have a fairly soft, gentle sort of facial features. So we've got one in the prime of life, say 40s to 50s. Just like us, yeah, absolute prime of life. And the other one in the 20s. And, and the baby... It's not a newborn baby by any means, the sort of toddler. I mean, we need to... I think there may be more bone under these shield bosses, and we're that may give us some more... We'll have to take the shield we'll bosses up anyway. tighten yeah. up on that. Don't you think it's incredibly moving? You've got the entire baby skeleton would have been covered and protected by two shields. That's Isn't right. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. There's no question of it being two graves. They went in together, even if one of them was put in days or weeks or months before the other one. There's, there's all due respect. It's... The burial practice here is really, really odd. I don't understand it. So Phil's double burial appears to have the skeleton of a child or baby placed between the legs of two adult males, unique in any British Saxon cemetery. Well, I think the Katie looks like the cat has got the cream, and I don't know what it is. Do you know what it <laughs> oh, yes, is? You'll, you'll love it. All right, what, love it. what is it, Katie? Look what we have found. It may be the rim of a bucket. But you, is it? I mean, is it a cop? Is it copper? It, it's a copper alloy, and, and it, it, the thing is, it could be either hand or it could be part of a vessel. Even if it's not like the other one, yeah, it might be made of wood with bronze fittings around it. But we're going to have to wait until tomorrow to find out if Mick's right. Over in the bone lab, the analysis of the skulls from this morning's double burial in trench two has also raised a few questions. Our supposed warrior woman turns out to be an elderly lady buried with an eight to ten year old juvenile. Surely too old and young to be warriors. So why were they buried with weapons? But the biggest mystery is why are we finding so many double burials? Based on evidence from previously excavated Saxon cemeteries, you'd expect to find one double burial in every 300 graves. We've got two in only five trenches. 
You know how we're always saying that the best finds always come up just when the cameras have stopped rolling? Well, would you believe it's happened again? It's 25 past seven, virtually everybody's gone home, and look at what Carenz has just found. What is it, Carenza? I think it's the one thing we've all been desperately hoping we'll find. It's a skull, there are the teeth, a spearhead from the spear it was buried with. But the really, really exciting thing is that it's so close to where that bucket came from, probably just a foot away. This may have been the person who was buried with the bucket. We found them at last. It's only nine o'clock in the morning of day three in our excavation of this fantastic Saxon cemetery, and already we're running out of time. The graves are so packed with grave goods and multiple skeletons, we may not have time to excavate them all. Last night, Katie unearthed the rim of what appeared to be another bucket. Though different in style to our tinned Byzantine bucket, this is a major discovery. Phil's been brought in to help record this extremely rare find. Is that wood you got there? This is just unbelievable. I've got decorations coming down in, in copper alloy with the, the yeah. bu bubbles on, underneath them. And then behind that are what looks like wooden slats narrow wooden slats coming down. This is absolutely extraordinary. You wouldn't imagine that the preservation was so good, would you? The excavation of the person who was buried with the bucket oh, has thrown up another mystery, yet another double burial, our third in five trenches. Um, definitely male. Um, you can see his big brown ridges here. Um, you can see that he's got a jutting out jaw. Hell of a jaw, well. hell yeah, of a jaw, really, yeah. <laughs> really angled jaw, very sort of Brad Pitt, I should imagine, so quite sort of angled jaw there. Chunky bones, robust bones, that's a sign of um, heavy sort of muscle coverage and, and generally that's male. Really, from the length of the, of the long bones as well, pretty tall, at least six foot. The other thing we can tell about him is that uh, he's certainly quite old, very worn teeth. Even the incisors here are worn right down and you've got the dentine which is inside the tooth exposed. Is that painful to him when he's eating? Not at all, no. As the dentine gets exposed it hardens up and it's quite a normal thing with ageing um, in archaeological skeletons. So if that's a male one, what do, what do you think about this one? They're looking quite cosy. This one's mm. lying on its side, sort of wrapped around the arms of this one. There's a little bit less of this one, isn't there? We seem to have lost a lot of the skull yeah, it's around not, there. Yeah, not so well preserved. Um, let's have a look at these teeth. Um, again, we're probably seeing quite a lot of wear on those molars there. I can have a better look at those when we get it out. So, again, we're probably looking at an adult. Um, and these limb bones are quite slender, so it may be a female, but we really need to get hold of the pelvis. Um, to find out whether it really is. That's the, that's the best indicator of sex, so um, it may be a female. Last night over in Trench 1, Carenza thought she'd found the skull of the person buried with the Byzantine bucket. This morning we may need to have a rethink as to who was buried with what. Phil? Yeah? <laughs> you know this is the grave that we possibly had the bucket out of. We certainly had two spearheads and a skull. We've got a bucket, another, another bucket. Another one? Yeah, look at that. Good you see, Lord. it starts there. The turquoise green of the copper alloy comes right round like that. It's a wooden bucket with, with, a, with, a, with a bronze skin or a copper skin yes, on the top yes, of it. Yes, yes, that's what it looks like. Isn't that amazing? This, yeah, well, this is bizarre because, I mean, we, we just got the site that's riddled with buckets because we got <laughs> one over there. Hang on a minute, both of you. I think I've got another one oh, over what? here. Another one? Ah, that's, exact, that's exactly like the one in our trench. Oh, right, that's what that's you That's the thought. rim, yeah. It's exactly the same. Perhaps these sheathed wooden buckets have been made using local skills and materials as Saxon copies of the Byzantine bucket. It began in Byzantium and it ended up in southern England. How the heck did it get all that way? I think probably very slowly because we, we think it didn't just start in Byzantium, it started in Antioch, which I can hardly reach. It's in Syria, 2,000 miles away. So somehow it made its way over to England and we don't quite know how. Um, it's probably through Byzantium, either across land or around the sea and then from Byzantium it could have got here, it could have been swapped for something by somebody who lived here and swapped again by somebody who lived here and swapped again etc etc all the way up to England. But would there have been people in southern England who had the money to be able to buy something like that? Well, indeed, I mean, the status of the object itself tells us that 
um, you're looking at people who want to own these kinds of, uh, of materials. Um, and it indicates that um, it, there were almost certainly contacts either side of the channel with families of a similar social standing. So it could have been the brothers or cousins of people who were ruling this little area who it swapped it? It could have been indeed, yeah. As we've already established, the river was a key factor in the formation and development of the Saxon settlement. It would therefore seem logical that the river was also a major artery in transporting people and things from the coast to inland settlements. Look at this splendid array of stuff. Now, Jenny, you've got the, uh, the traditional costume on there, but it isn't, it isn't just functional, is it? No, it's very highly decorated. Uh, this sort of brooch used to pin at the shoulders. This style, or you might use an annular like this, or a saucer, or a disc brooch like these. Oh, beautiful things, but I mean, Angela, can these all be local? I have to say, I've never, never seen no, one of these in No, they're area. not local, no. I mean, that's a cowry shell. That's probably come all the way from the Red Sea. So uh, we're talking long distance uh, movement of objects here. Uh, and what about all, I mean, there's lots of we've beautiful got, jewels. Yeah, we've got, we've got um, amber from the Baltic. Right. We've got um, an amethyst. And we've got the little tiny ones are, in fact, garnets and pearls. So incredibly long distance yes. uh, trade. Yes. But, I mean, this looks, I mean, for our purposes, we see it all beautifully laid out, but it looks like a shop. So is that what we would have had on the riverbank, people setting up a shop, hoping to make a few quid? I don't know. Uh, well, not a few quid, no, because, of course, we're in a pre-monetary system here. We're, we're talking sort of barter or exchange. So you don't need the money. Don't need so the money. So why do you need the things? What's it, what's it about? It's partly human act sort of acquisitiveness of human nature. You, you see nice something, you want it, you know, you know what it's like, we, we all do this. Um, and the Anglo-Saxons, you know, were probably exactly the same as us. But also these things are functional, some are necessities, uh, brooches you have to have to hold your clothes oh, so together. so some foreigner comes along and goes, oh, you don't want to hold up your dress like that, I've got a much better way. Is that Absolutely, that's the beginning of fashion. After the highly prized and decorated Byzantine bucket arrived at our settlement, a new fashion for buckets was obviously born here. We're trying to revive that by making our own bucket, though it still looks like a fruit bowl even after countless hammerings. Back on the mound, it's starting to look like our latest double burial contains more than just a bucket. It looks like there's enamel. That is really incredible. So how does that work as a buckle? Uh, if I take this one off... Yeah. <laughs> probably the easiest thing to do. So that's the best way to explain it, I think. My, the little pin of my buckle is the same as this great big thing. Good oh, Lord! It's got this huge plate on the, on the base of it where it's got the loop that goes round, round the bar, um, which will be underneath this. So the next thing we're looking for is, is the frame. But then I'm guessing, because this, I've not ever seen anything like this before. Um, enamel's really unusual. <laughs> Wow. Cool. <laughs> Fully conserved, the buckle would look something like this. So now we can see the two burials complete with all their grave goods. A tall middle-aged man with knife, spear and shield, alongside possibly a younger female. Once again the female's equipped for war, but balanced on the lower shield, a copper sheathed wooden bucket. It's extremely unusual for so many weapons to be found as grave goods. Careful analysis may give us some clues to these strange Saxon burial practices. This is the spearhead from Trench One. Oh yeah. Uh, from near the bucket was found. And I'm looking at details, things in the corrosion that might tell us a bit more about the burial. My goodness, is that what I think it is? I think it's a fly pupae. I think it is, isn't it? It's sort of part of this sort of exoskeleton there. Mm -hmm. And then you've almost got a cast of the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's incredible, isn't it? I know, it's, it's wonderful. But I think what this means then is that there were maggots on this body, mm -hmm. the body associated with this spear when it was in the grave, and that they've pupated. And what you're seeing is the cast and the remnant of the pupae. And now the spearhead wasn't found directly on the body. It was, quite, it was a bit of a distance away. In forensic cases, what you tend to see is if you discover a body, um, when you first reveal it, the, the maggots will actually go away from the body because huh. they're looking for somewhere that's more suitable to pup pupate. Oh. Um, and they don't seem to like to do that on the body if they don't have to. Um, so they probably moved away within the confines of the burial environment mm -hmm. and found somewhere to pupate. And, and what we're looking mm. at really is what's left of that. Wow. 
It's time to catch up on the latest news from Bucket City. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? You can see the copper alloy bands around it, decorative bands down four sides. Beautiful, beautiful object. Was there wood associated with that or was it just metal? It's wood, yes. Look, I'll show you on the trench cam. Look, can you see in there, yeah. the dark black is wood and then the turquoise green yeah. is the copper alloy banding around it. But then we found another one. Look at this <laughs> here. You see that? It's got a rim around the top and then down the side. So that's got bands of bronze around it as well. You have had a good day, haven't you? <laughs> what about the size of them? These two look pretty similar in size. Well, yeah. even more interesting, there's not just two. We then found a third <laughs> over here. All the same size? More well, or less, aren't they? Yeah. They are more or less, but what's really interesting, that is 12 centimetres in diameter, that's 13, that's 14, so they could all have nested in each other, and the silver one from Antioch from the middle is just over 15. They'd all have fitted one inside the other. We can only speculate as to how these buckets were used in Saxon life and death rituals. Perhaps they were filled with food or drink for feasting at the funeral, or for the deceased person's journey to the afterlife. Future analysis of the material inside our excavated buckets may provide the answer. What kind of status do you think the people were who were buried here? Well, this, this is a stunning find. I mean, as a burial deposit, it can only really represent people who were regarded as tri tribal leaders. Oh! Corenta, how do you think all this worked, then? Well, I think how we know that it's such an impressive burial is we think it's all part of one burial. It's incredibly symmetrical. That's what really screams at you. And those post holes look like they're part of a structure that might have gone over oh, the top. Yeah. So Had you a canopy? A uh, yeah, yeah, a canopy or a chamber that perhaps people could have come and visited the graves as they were laid out there with all their glorious, perfect items, shields, spears. They've all got shields and spears, both the skeletons. One thing we do know for certain is that our Saxons from this part of Hampshire wouldn't have been able to read the inscription on our Byzantine bucket. Written in ancient Greek, it offers advice for the owner. Use this lady for many happy years. Ray's almost finished adding the inscription and hunting scenes to our now raised replica. Thousands of punch marks make up the intricate pattern. With only minutes to spare before the end of our live programme, it's dipped in molten tin to give the appearance of silver. It's this silver shine that gives us one last clue as to why they were important as grave goods. I think these showy, flashy items, if I was digging them up on a Bronze Age site, yeah. they'd be to impress the other people in, in, in my village, in my community. You're, you're nodding yeah. my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's about that. the living yeah. as much as the dead. So it's not, it's not going to the afterlife? Then. No, it's display. It's, yeah. it's, it's what they want to communicate to the people who are coming to the funeral. Well, so what does that say about the kind of funerals that they would have conducted? Well, that they, they would have been visible, laid out in the grave. They wouldn't have been in a coffin, lowered in. They would have been there with their bucket here and their spear here, ready for everybody to come and see. And the people who came to see them would know what the bucket meant. You are pretty sure that they were laid out, and this isn't just supposition. What about all the rest of the things that you said? How can you possibly know? Well, we, we don't know a lot of it. We don't know how much feasting there was, where the fires were lit, how far the relatives came from. We don't know masses of things, but we're, we're putting together fragments of evidence to make a jigsaw puzzle. Like what? Well, fragments like a lot of buckets in one place, but perhaps a lot of blue beads in another cemetery. Um, can, can you tell from the way the objects are found in the ground now by the archaeologists uh, about that sort of thing? Yeah, some people have spears with the head up here, some people have spears with the spearhead down at the feet. There's a lot of this, this patterning which is, you can only see the results of when you look at thousands of graves over hundreds of cemeteries. There's just so much to find out. It's very, very strange. These people, they're, they, they've all got weapons. I've never heard of that before. This is something entirely different. That was the end of our third day and we'd run out of time. So, with five wooden buckets and ten skeletons still to excavate, welcome to day four. The skeletons are finally giving us some tantalising clues about the relationship between the bodies in adjoining graves. One of the really in interesting things about this one though, Katie, is this, is this line here. Can you yeah. see it? This sort of zigzaggy line. Yep. This is what we call a retained metopic suture. When babies are born, their skulls are in lots of different pieces which overlap during the birth yeah. process to allow birth. 
Usually this suture, which you, very, you don't see very often on adult skulls, it closes by about the age of two to four. Right. Generally, when this doesn't fuse and completely disappear, it's what we call a developmental failure, but not one that has any sort of health implications or anything. Right. People who have this generally tend to be related to one another. And by sheer coincidence, or not, as the case may be, in Jenny's trench we've got this adult female yeah. who's also got a retained metopic suture. So they may actually be related They may well to be another. related to one another. God, isn't that interesting? It's absolutely fabulous. And, and I guess it's what you'd expect in a sort of dispersed settlement, which is what the Anglo-Saxon period is noted for, that people would be related to one another, well, much more so. Small groups, aren't they, yeah, like intermarrying? Yeah, 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 that's right. Another thing that's is interesting here, Katie, is this fracture line along here. Do you see it? Oh, yeah, it's really faint. Yeah, but it's all the thing that's slightly disconcerting with it is it's really smooth. Yeah. And when bone breaks that's been in the ground for a while it breaks in these raggedy lines yeah um, because it's got no sort of plasticity left because all the collagen's degraded when bone is broken either by trauma or a blade or whatever and it's got lots of collagen left it breaks in very smooth predictable lines and this this line here is the sort of line that you'd expect when bone is broken when it's fresh so would this have been enough to actually have killed him well, it depends what it's associated with, and until we get it out and have a proper look at it, we can't really be sure about that. Post-excavation examination of the skull does point to some sort of head trauma, though this could be explained by something as simple as dropping the body during the funeral. And with the incidence of fused metopic sutures occurring in less than 4% of the population, it's almost certain that the two Saxons buried in adjoining graves were related. By dating the grave goods, we can conclude that our cemetery was in operation around 500 AD. By examining the bones and the density of burials, that it was an extended family group centred on the mound, and that the people who are buried here, though maybe not warriors, held weapons in high regard. But why they're buried in pairs with buckets will, for the time being, have to remain an enigma. And there's another Time Team adventure over on Civilization next. Here on Discovery Channel, though, just what does it take to build the ultimate combat helicopter?